so welcome back, everyone. Um, so now that we've done the intro for the workshop, we're going to move on to the second section, which is all about setting up a collaborative research space. So as Brian uh, alluded to in the first section, one of the problems we face as researchers is that the research workflow is very long and very distributed. It has a lot of pieces and parts to it, right? We start with search and discovery, and then there are a whole bunch of steps, and then finally, maybe a couple years later, we get to the published report. And if I'm not in your lab, the only thing I ever see is the published report. I don't know any of the other things that happened. Even if I am in your lab, even if it's my own research, probably like four months, six months, maybe a year if I'm lucky, after I publish the paper, I'm not going to remember the rest of that cycle, right? We're humans, our memories are not is not perfect, and we all have a lot to do. And so a lot of that detail is lost. And so what this can do is create problems because we've literally forgotten where files are, we've forgotten what files are, right? I forget things. I lose things. And I'm not particularly motivated to back document unless I have a really good reason, unless a grad student comes to me and says, hey, I would really like to pick up a project that you did a couple years ago, I'm probably never going to try to do that back, up, back documentation. And when I do try, just like Brian suggested, it's going to be really, really, really difficult. And I have collaborators. So collaborators in and of themselves are not a problem. But the issue is that all of a sudden, I have files that are living on my computer and my collaborators' computers and my collaborators' flash drives and my flash drives and their email and my email and their Dropbox and my GitHub, and all of a sudden we have files every which way. And it can be really hard to pull those files all back together, figure out which is the proper versions of those files, even figure out if like myself and my advisor who have the same named files, if those files are even actually the same. And so this really becomes an issue with these large distributed workflows. So what can we do about that? The first thing we actually want to think about doing is setting up a common research space and structure our research before we get started. One of the things you're going to hear me say a lot during this workshop is put in the work at the beginning so that we have our structure, we have our plan, and as we go through the process, we're just filling in the information. You can think of this kind of as setting a research management plan. Sometimes we talk about data management plans, which is, you know, what am I going to do with my data? How am I going to store my data? But we really want to think about what am I going to do with my research? How am I going to manage that? How am I going to store it as I go through that research process so that I can reproduce my own work? So what we're going to be using to create that structured research space is the open science framework, which Brian mentioned. So I'm going to kind of show you um, some of the features of the OSF to set up that structured workspace. And then I'm going to have you all do a short activity to kind of start getting that structure in place. So as Brian mentioned, the Open Science Framework is a free open source web tool. So right now, you can see my OSF account. Um, this is my dashboard. There's a list of the last kind of 10 projects that I've worked most recently on. But where I'm going to start, because this is a new research question for me, is I'm going to start by creating a project. So a project on the OSF can literally be anything. Um, it can be an individual research question. It can be a series of studies, a line of research, a grant, a lab group, um, a class. Just think of it as what is the largest kind of structure that I want to be able to nest under. For this particular workshop, we're just going to start really simple and think about what would a structured work space be if I was thinking about one particular study. So to do that, I'm going to click on this green Create New Project button. I'm going to give it some sort of descriptive name. Uh, let's go with APS Workshop. I'm going to click Create, and then go to that project. So this looks pretty sparse right now. Every project on the OSF starts out pretty much exactly the same, and it starts out very blank. Part of that is so that different workflows and different structures can be built up on the system. It was built to be very domain agnostic. So the type of research workflow and the type of structured workspace that a psychologist might want might be different than what a physicist might want. And frankly, the type of structured workspace that I want, even though I'm a social psychologist, is probably a little bit different than what Brian might want, and he's also a social psychologist. So it starts pretty flat, and then you can build up the structure you want. So I'm just going to go through a couple of the common 
kind of features of the system so that we can work with them in an activity. So you'll see I have the title of my workshop. Right now, I'm the only contributor on this. It has a date for the creation. And then there are a couple of kind of big chunks on the screen that are sections. So this is the wiki. This is a real-time collaborative editor where I can put in text or images or hyperlinks to help describe my project. I tend to use it as kind of the working abstract of my project. So describe kind of what my project is about and update that as I get more information about what I'm planning to do with my project. So the wiki is my collaborative editor. To get into it, I'm going to click on this little widget right here. And you'll see this opens up an editor in the right side of my screen. So it's Markdown enabled. If you happen to know what Markdown is, it's just a formatting um, language. If you don't happen to know the Markdown syntax, you can use the little um, buttons. So when I start a project, the first thing I do is I write down my research question. Um, I used to write it down in paper notebooks in lab meetings when I was having discussions with my advisor or with um, the people in my lab group. And of course, the paper notebook went missing. And then like two weeks later, I would have another meeting with my advisor and be like, Allison, we had a research question. What in the world was our research question? It was awesome. She's like, didn't you write it down? I'm like, yes, I wrote it down, but I lost the notebook. So the minute we kind of know, OK, this is what our project is, we want to start that documentation, right? We never want to try and assume, oh, yeah, we'll remember it. Because this way, we can never forget. So I'm just going to put in my own research question which is, um, do men and women differ in self-reported uh, political ideology? And then I'm then going to scroll down and click Save. And then that is in my wiki. It will always be there. And if I go back to my project, I can see that it appears right there in my project. As this kind of evolves and maybe I add more information, I can add that and that will update. So there's the wiki. There's also a section for me to upload files to the system. We'll talk a lot more about files um, in a future segment, but I did want to mention it. Right now, you can see it's just kind of one giant bucket for files. Um, so I can upload files to the system by clicking on this OSF storage uh, icon, and then I get this upload link. So you can upload pretty much any type of file to the system that you want. So uh, PDFs, Word documents, uh, data files, R scripts, SPSS scripts. Um, you can upload any file as long as it is less than 5 gigabytes in size. Um, but as Brian also alluded to, part of this is going to allow you to knit together sections of your workflow, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So if you already have a place where you tend to store your data, so for example, maybe your university has a box.com account, you can connect that up. But if there isn't a place where you tend to already store your files in some sort of collaborative cloud storage environment, you can upload them directly to the OSF if that makes sense for you. So right now, this is very, as I mentioned, kind of flat. It's one giant bucket. Um, I know with my research, I usually end up with a couple hundred files for any given project, and it can balloon to you know, way more than that if it's a really big project. So I could just dump them all into one section, um, but probably eventually then I would just end up with kind of a giant project that I actually can't find anything within it. So I'm probably going to want to add structure to this project. The way I add structure is by using this Add Component button. So you can kind of think of structuring a project in two ways. You could upload all the files and then move everything around. That's one way to do it. I tend to like to add the structure to my project before I've even started my research as a way to give myself a concrete plan of this is how I plan to organize my project. And so that way, anytime I go back to this project, I have that mental reminder, oh yeah, I was supposed to be keeping track of my materials. Oh yeah, I said I'd be uploading my R scripts. Oh, yeah, I said I'd be uploading my data. And so by creating that structured space first, it actually helps me remember as I'm getting in files, as I'm generating them, to put them in the place where they belong. So to add that structure, I'm going to click Add Component. And then I'm going to give it a name. I know I'm going to want to have a section for materials. I can give it any name I want. And then I can give it a descriptive category. And then I'm going to click Add. 
So now I have a separate section of my project. If I click on this, what you'll notice is that this materials section looks very much like the APS workshop part of my project, right? It has a contributor, it has a wiki, it has its own section for files, and I can actually add components underneath this. And so each of those components is creating a separate subsection of my project that is kind of independent. And I can add files to it, I can give it a description to really kind of structure my workspace and figure out what is supposed to live in here. So because this is supposed to be collaborative, right now I am the only contributor to this. So even if I sent Brian the link at the top of this page, if I sent it to him and said, hey, Brian, here's the APS workshop, um, can you please upload our slides? He would get that link, um, he would attempt to go to it, and what he would see is a forbidden sign. He would email me back and say, Courtney, I cannot access your project. So everything on the OSF, as Brian mentioned, is private by default. There's this little public-private toggle up here. So at any point, I can make a project public if I choose to. But right now, we're just starting our project, right? I don't want to make this public right now because we haven't even started looking at our data. So instead, I want to invite Brian into my research space. I want to add him as a contributor. So to do that, I click on the Contributors tab. I search for his name. And then once it finds him in the system, I can add him. Now, I have a couple of ways to add him because there are a couple of different permission settings. If I want Brian to have as much power over this project as I do, I can add him as an administrator. So what that means is he can upload and download files, he can change things, he can add components. Possibly most importantly, he can make decisions about the public-private settings of this project. He can make parts of it public. So maybe I decide that I don't want Brian to be an adm administrator. He should not have this much power over my project. Uh, maybe in this situation, he's just acting as my research assistant. He's just collecting data for me. So maybe it makes more sense to add him as read-write. What that means is he can upload and download files, he can see into my project, but he doesn't have that power over making things public or private. Um, or if I really didn't want him to be able to do anything to any of the files, maybe he's um, a research assistant and just needs to be able to see what the protocol is, but I don't want him to have access to the data um, to change it. I could add him as just read. He would only be able to view things, he wouldn't be able to change things. So I can have really fine green control over who can change my files and who can access them. So I'm gonna add Brian, and it's gonna say what parts of this project do I wanna add him to? So I'm gonna say I want him to have access to both materials and the APS workshop section. So what this should suggest is one other thing that components do, apart from just kind of sectioning off files, is they give me control over who has access to what parts of my project. So Brian can see both what will end up in my materials section as well as the contents of this wiki. Um, I'm gonna add another component, this one I'm gonna call data, and you'll see this checkbox. When I'm adding this component, I know I want Brian to be able to see my data, so I wanna add all the contributors from the APS workshop to this component as well. I add that, and then I realize, you know, there's also somebody else I wanna have access to this component. I'm gonna add my coworker, Sarah Bowman, and search that as well. So each component has completely independent public-private settings and independent contributor settings from the section up top. So now Sarah has access to the data section of my project, but she doesn't have access to the material. So by using components, I can create small, almost silos within my project to give certain people access to only the parts of my research process that they need to be seeing or interacting with at a given time. So what have we really created here? As I keep mentioning, this is a private research space that all of my contributors can get access to. So rather than having to share files or share things like Dropbox accounts or GitHub repos or anything like that over email or sending links back and forth, what we will end up building over the course of this project is a research space where Brian and I can share all those materials from one location. So those materials can never get out of sync. I won't have to email Brian and be like, hey Brian, 
do you have version three of the analysis? Because I have versions one, two, and four, but like, I'm sure there was a three. Do you have it? And he'll email back and be like, I have version four, but it's actually dated before version two. So like, who knows where version three is, but something's gone horribly wrong. So what we'll do is build up this space so that all our files are here, they're all versioned, and we all, as collaborators, know what is going on with our research process. But the first thing I'm going to have you all do is actually just start to create the bones of this structure. So this is going to be the first activity section of the workshop. So I just showed you how to do a bunch of things. So the slide is organized so that there are a couple of activities for the PI, and then a couple activities for either the one or the two research assistants that your group has. So for each PI in the group, if you could create an OSF project, add the other group members as contributors, and then once you've done that, create a data component with all the contributors having access to that component. Research assistants, once you have been given access to the project, if you could go ahead and write your group's research question in the wiki, and also create a second component, a materials component. As I mentioned, Brian and I, um, as you all are working on this activity, will be kind of floating around in the room. So if you run into any trouble with any of this, just raise your hand and we'll come around and help. Um, so go ahead and get started on the first activity. Um, and then once you all are done with that, we'll come back and take questions about this section. All right, so it looks like everybody has finished um, the group activity. Hopefully you didn't have too much trouble getting through those points. Um, so what we're going to do now is open it up to questions um, about either the first section or the second section. Um, so any questions that kind of came up while we were presenting or questions that came up as you were working through the activity points in the OSF, maybe you saw things um, that you kind of wondered about or you had questions about how exactly some of the features worked as you started to work through them. Um, so um, I had a question like while well, working on creating the project, um, can I move a component hierarchically up? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So within a project, once you've created a component, um, so for example, I can actually show you. Uh, so the question was about whether you can kind of move components once they've already been created. So once you create a component in a project, you can't actually move it. Um, so if I wanted to nest data under materials after already creating it, I couldn't do that. What you can do, though, is, you know, ever so often you're creating a project structure, um, you realize you've made a mistake. You can delete components and then recreate them in another location. So if I wanted to delete data, for example, I would go into that component, click on the settings tab, and then I would have this delete component option. So if I deleted that, the component would disappear, and then I could, um, if I wanted to uh, nest it under materials, say, I could go ahead, go back into my materials component, and then add another component underneath that, call it data, and that would nest it under there. That makes sense? Yeah. Are you guys working on an app? An Android or an iPhone app? Any kind of OSF app? Is that happening? The question was, are we working on an app like for the Android or the iPhone? And right now we are not. Uh, the browser is mobile compatible, so if you open it up uh, on your iPhone through the web browser, you can still work with the OSF that way. And uh, in terms of efficiency, that's the priority compared to now maintaining and hosting multiple different uh, applications or platforms uh, for engaging with the OSF. So if, for efficiency purposes, we're sticking with just the web browser for now. All right, uh, so thank you for the questions. Um, since that seems to be all for this section, we're gonna go ahead and conclude the first section about creating a structured research space. Um, then the next section will be talking about pre-registration and pre-analysis plans. Thank you.